In Occupy All Streets, we examine the damage that cars did to cities when they occupied the streets a century ago. We visited some European city centers that had taken their streets back from cars and saw how popular these car-free areas are. We looked at the advantages of converting American cities to the car-free model. Auto manufacturers claim that cars will eventually be clean and run on sustainable energy. There is some chance this will happen, but that does not solve any of the other problems with cars. They would continue to dominate city streets and occupy far too much space. So, if we decided to remove all cars from our cities, could we do this? The answer is yes, but different solutions are needed for new cities and existing cities. We'll take up new cities first. The book Car-Free Cities proposed a theoretical design for entirely car-free cities. It begins with the arrangement of the city as a whole and then zooms in to the district, block, and building levels. The city would be home to a million people. Standard urban rail systems provide fast transport between any two districts in the city. Walking to or from a transit stop never takes more than five minutes and maximum door-to-door -door travel time is just 35 minutes. Only a single transfer is ever required. Zooming in, we see a typical district half a mile in diameter that houses 12,000 people. Work and study space is provided for 8,000. The transit stop is at the center. Most goods and services are available right in the district. Wide streets are not required except for the Central Boulevard, which is only as wide as a Manhattan Avenue. Other streets are less than half that width, often much less. There is still ample room for everything except cars. At the block level, we see hollow blocks bordered by cozy streets. A green courtyard, at least as large as this one, fills the center of the block. Small neighborhood squares arise at many street intersections. Buildings are narrow and mostly four stories tall. They are usually less than 30 feet deep, so daylight fills the rooms. Each family has its own building and plenty of space. Most ground floors are occupied by shops, offices, and workshops. Buildings have direct access to the courtyard in back. Buildings like these have stood in cities since Roman times. They make very efficient use of land, are reasonably inexpensive, and offer an excellent quality of life. The most difficult challenge in any car-free project is large freight. In existing cities, truck traffic can be greatly reduced, but in new cities it can be entirely eliminated. The urban freight system originates in utility areas established at the periphery of the city. Utility areas also provide locations for heavy industry and garages for cars arriving at the city. No one lives in a utility area. Road and rail freight services terminate there and standard shipping containers are delivered into the city by a dedicated rail system. Emergency services are provided in the usual manner over a network of medium-width streets that covers the entire city. China is building new cities at a breathtaking rate and any of these could follow the principles just described. What about existing cities? They will require some compromise with best practice but can still achieve essentially the same benefits as new cities. Take Manhattan as an example. The already fine subway would be augmented by the completion of the 2nd Avenue subway and the addition of a 10th Avenue light rail line. Crosstown buses are replaced by streetcars as is already planned for 42nd Street. These changes provide a complete grid of good public transport. Loop tracks, shown in red, provide freight service using specialized trams that deliver standard containers. They are loaded at riverfront terminals supplied by barges arriving from New York's seaports. Local delivery is by electric handcart. A few slow electric trucks will be needed to make heavy local deliveries, but they would travel only as far as the nearest freight loop. Without cars, Manhattan becomes a cyclist's paradise. Walking is not only far more pleasant, but also much faster, as there is no more tedious waiting for the walk signal. Each city will require a tailor-made approach. Given that rail is by far the most efficient means of urban transport, we can meet the transport needs of every city making the conversion. Car-free cities will be more sustainable and healthier places to live. The quality of life will improve dramatically. 
The economic efficiency of bikes and trains compared to cars and trucks would improve the city's economic position in the world. The recovery of valuable land for productive use is a major gain. This way forward meets the needs of the 99%. The proposals have been worked out in great detail and no significant problems remain to be solved. Now we simply need to make a choice. Do we want better, more humane cities that will survive into the future or not?